I have a very unpopular theory regarding the decision to send Challenger 2s to Ukraine. I believe that it is a huge mistake that will cost a lot more than what it will gain for the people of Ukraine. Let's begin. A part of me cannot help believing that this is a form of virtue signaling by the British government during a time when England is on its knees and in desperate need of some positive PR. You would unfortunately have to live here to fully understand what I am saying. One of the previous prime ministers, Boris Johnson, made his name supporting Ukraine in the early days of war, he was hugely popular in both countries, more so than the current PM and yet he never transferred offensive weapons to the Ukrainians like MBTS. It feels like there may be a form of gamesmanship, by the current PM, Rishi Sunak, to not only upstage the stumbling Germans and their leopards, but also to garner the same cult following enjoyed by Boris. Let's also keep in mind, that we are talking about 12 tanks. As good as the Challenger 2 may be and it's important to stress that it has never, ever been tested by an effective opposition before. You are not going to be marching on Moscow with 12 tanks. So, what is England hoping to achieve here? My guess is to tell the world that they were the first to send tanks to Ukraine, gain support at home and stick one to the EU. Then of course there is the damned rifled barrel. Highly effective as it may be. It is a logistical nightmare requiring ammunition to be sent with the tanks and the obvious point of no other ammunition already in country being interchangeable. It also uses ammunition that is described to be three-part ammunition, consisting of the projectile, charge and vent tube, or rather unusual setup and one that makes storage difficult. Training is another dilemma, apparently 60 Ukrainians are heading for training. When they are knocked out, killed, or wounded, what then? It's not possible to effectively transfer a T-72 crew directly to a Challenger. It's simply not the same thing and not to mention it requires another crew member to load. But the biggest issue is the change of mindset from Russian tank doctrine to one suiting the Challenger 2 in a limited numbers role. There are some other points that I want to raise but let's first dive into story time. Mist spreads out over the field, the iciness of the cold making the metal of the tank almost unbearable. Oleg peers out of the turret hatch and scans the horizon of the large open field in front of him. He has been the commander of his beloved Alina, for the last two months of training, before that he had commanded one of Ukraine's rare and reliable T-84 Oplots. His success in battle had given him the honor of being trained on one of the new Challenger 2 main battle tanks recently received from England and now he was taking her into battle as the spearhead of the assault on Soldar. Scan complete and feeling rest assured that for now the area is clear he pushes his mic to his mouth and whispers, Driver, forward. The behemoth leaps out of the undergrowth and pushes forward. Oleg scans the rear, his backup of two more challengers follow just behind in a neat diamond formation, beyond that are the APCs with the infantry support. Oleg and the reconnaissance drones haven't noticed that there is a Russian Alpha team on the edge of their right flank, about 2,000 meters away. This team of Russians were put here for one reason and one reason only, to destroy a challenger too and to film themselves doing it. The planning for this operation had started the minute the Kremlin knew that the challengers would be sent. Now the captain in charge had assured his commanders that a cornet would do the job, but they weren't going to take the chance on the English tank, by using a direct fire weapon and decided that a top-down attack would have the best chance of success. Having captured almost 12 javelin systems, they decided to employ one of these. They slowly pull the camo netting off their captured javelin, acquire the target and fire. Oleg is still peering out of the turret when the javelin explodes about one foot away from his head, its shape charge sending a high-velocity stream of molten metal through the much thinner roof armor and into the turret. The unexpected attack cooks off the shell being readied for loading and the crew is vaporized in the resultant explosion. Twelve hours later, the Kremlin releases the footage of the attack to the world. The indestructible tank is no more. Within two months, Ukraine loses another seven challengers in highly coordinated, targeted attacks. Their demise is broadcast to the world and the anti-NATO, anti-West and anti-Ukraine propaganda value is massive. 
Ukraine morale cracks, and the future starts to look uncertain. Whilst the story is a hypothetical situation there are some more obvious factual points that require discussion. Here is the irony considering all of this, we don't believe that this tank is necessarily an offensive weapon. Let's consider what the Challenger was designed to do. Not to run around the battlefield covering 50 or 60 miles a day but to sit quietly and wait hull down for the masses of Soviet tanks attacking across the North German plain. If a British tank could quickly pick off five or six leading Soviet tanks then pull back to another prepared position and do the same again and take minimal damage while moving, it had done the job what it was designed to do, slowing down or even stopping that Soviet attacking force until the main force and subsequent reserves arrived to back up. Built with massive protection to enable the tank to survive multiple hits from the latest Soviet handheld and portable weapons was far more important than speed around the battlefield where the attack helicopters and fast jets designed specifically to attack tanks were becoming the dominant threat. The four men of a tank crew were considered the biggest asset, and worth preserving for they can be used again and again in different tanks as and when needed. Unlike the Abrams and Leopard, the Challenger was designed to support infantry and not to be supported by infantry, it is a moving hard point. Taking on tanks was a secondary consideration, although it is highly effective at doing that. The British's love for the HESH or High Explosive Squash Head Round came from how effective it is at destroying fortified bunkers, IFVs, APCs, and other technical light armored machines. So, what is the tank famous for? It's amazing crew protection for the period late 1990s and early 2000s. The Challenger has a reputation built around its armor, Dorchester 2F, which is incorrectly referred to as Chobham. The direct makeup of this armor is a state secret, but the very best guesses have it as a composite material made up of ceramics, metals, and composites, which are layered together in blocks. These are placed around the tank in conjunction with Romre ERA which of consists of two parts, the actual tiles and the mounting system. The latter is normally bolted or welded onto the vehicle and the explosive reactive armor tiles are then bolted in place. The actual ERA tiles consist of a layer of explosive which is sandwiched between two plates. When hit, the explosive drives the two plates apart and breaks up the jet of metal which the shaped charge directs at the target. The frontal armor was designed to resist all KE threats at point blank except the Soviet 115mm APFSDS this could penetrate the front at 200 meters, according to British estimates. The side armor could stop 76mm APT at 2000m at a 50 degree angle, 57mm APT at 2800m at a 50 degree angle and 45mm APT at 1000m at a 40 degree angle. It also provided full protection against Carl Gustav ammunition, 6-inch and 5-inch shaped charge warheads at angles greater than 65 and 60 degrees respectively. This protection assessment is based on British calculations made with penetration figures for Soviet weapons provided by the U.S. Army. Also, for better collective protection, the NBC generators and systems were moved to the turret bustle. Some tests were performed with various coating and camouflage nets to reduce both thermal and radar signatures. For active protection, a modernized set of L-8 smoke dischargers was also fitted, five per side. They could fire various frag projectiles, smoke and IR flares. The engine was also fitted with the injection system and the exhaust manifolds to create additional smoke. Both the crew compartment and engine compartment received their own fire detectors and extinguishers. Internal arrangement of the turret remains largely unchanged. A study established that autoloaders reduced battlefield survivability and caused reliability concerns therefore manual loading is still the norm. The Russians have found out the hard way that this autoloader has its benefits in terms of less crew and an arguably faster delivery, but its downsides can be catastrophic and it's all due to the positioning of the ammunition, which sits in a circle around the interior of the turret, along the ring. 
If the hull is penetrated, this often leads to an ammo cook-off resulting in the turret being ejected high into the sky and the death of the crew. Despite all of this, nothing is impenetrable, and the armor of the Challenger can be penetrated and obviously this doesn't take a top-down attack into account where the armor is limited. So surely there is active protection system, or APS fitted as the final piece in the protection jigsaw puzzle. Despite all the armor protection and a very real focus on crew survivability, the tank is still missing any form of APS. This is a major problem and frankly is indicative of a British army that has been heavily defunded by current governments and not in a financial position to upgrade their weapons to meet modern problems. The Israelis learnt this mistake during their various forays into Lebanon, with Cornet ATGMs taking out numerous Merkava tanks. This experience would push the development of the Israeli trophy system, something that would set the benchmark for an APS around the world. The first Israeli tanks were fitted with trophy in 2010 with the first successful use coming in 2011, when a Merkava Mark IV foiled a missile attack aimed toward it. To put this into context, the United Kingdom is considering trophy for the anticipated Challenger 3 tank. The experience of the Leopard 2 of 4s in Syria was another example of how important an APS is to tank and crew survivability, the Turkish units didn't have it and suffered accordingly. Now obviously the Leopard 2 S4 is a different type of tank designed for quick offensive action with arguably less armor, but it did highlight the vulnerabilities of modern tanks and frankly dispelled the mighty myth around the Leopard. Something that hasn't happened to the Challenger yet. Let's not even start with the Abrams, that when in the hands of semi-trained, inexperienced crews have suffered losses that would and should make the American arms industry blush. With Iraq experiencing losses to cornet units operated by ISIL, who would have been equally poorly trained as the tank crews. But the bad news doesn't stop there, the South Koreans have stated that the North Korean Bolsi 5 ATGM can penetrate the front and sides of the modern K-2 Black Panther tank. The Bolsi 5 is a North Korean missile system designed from a copy of the Cornet. Please don't forget that the Russians are buying munitions from North Korea so it's a matter of time before this finds its way onto the Ukrainian battlefield. It's also not the best news for Poland that will soon be adding K-5s into its armored forces. In conclusion, I am not concerned about a Challenger 2 tank battle, unless it is done at point-blank range. For me, it's all about the sneak missile attack and the guarantee that the Russian or Wagner forces will hunt them out for the massive propaganda boost. That coupled with the logistics and poor number of tanks available, makes this shipment, at least as far as I am concerned, a very bad idea. Its loss will be used against us come what may.